Well, um, great to be in Abu Dhabi, first time for me. Thanks a lot to the organizers that have made this possible. Um, I want to tell you really <clears throat> two different stories. One is about, uh, so two different talks. One is about uh, why deep networks work. That has been a big question uh, throughout the last uh, uh, 12 years or so at least. Um, and then I'll tell you a number of results because of time only some of them about a detailed analysis of the dynamics involved in training deep RLU networks for classification under the square laws. So the first of next slide <coughs> um, is um, an old movie from 95. This was a project we had with Daimler-Benz, Mercedes. This is a movie um, that was done in Ulm, where the research labs of Mercedes are. And this was one of the first, probably the first uh, people detection, pedestrian detection system based on machine learning. So this was 25 years ago um, uh, or more. And you can see that there are a few mistakes, like at the end, uh, the traffic light is um, mistaken for a pedestrian and there are some misses detection and so on. At the time, 25 years ago, we were very happy about the performance of this system was uh, like one mistake every three frames. But on the other hand, these were 10 mistakes per second which made it of scientific interest, but absolutely of no practical use at all. Now, 25 years later, for the same problem, Mobileye, who is the leading vision um, developing system for cars, based in Jerusalem, Israel, has a uh, error rate of about one error every 50 of 100,000 kilometers of driving. If you do back of the envelope calculations, this is about one million times more accurate than the system we had then. And this corresponds roughly to doubling accuracy every year for 25 years. So that's why <clears throat> in the last, um, I would say, decade or a bit more, there have been a lot of important applications of machine learning because a combination of algorithms and especially development of computers and storing um, have made um, really possible for application things that before were only in of interest in the lab. So the point is, however, that during this last 20 years, there are, there are a lot of applications, but we still don't understand why deep networks work as well as they do. Next slide. Um, make the point that this actually happened other times in history, history of science. The fact that you had something that uh, you, you did not quite understand, but was immediately quite useful. And one story that I like is the one of electricity. People don't know very much about it, but electricity really was invented in the year 1800. Next slide by Alessandro Volta, <coughs> who was a professor in, in uh, Pavia, which is 30 kilometers from Milan. He did that. It was an accidental discovery. Um, he wanted to show that one of his colleagues, Galvani, in Bologna, was wrong, and electricity was not a biological origin. Um, now, he was made a count by Napoleon, and um, it was the first time scientists had a continuous source of electricity. The pila, which is shown here in uh, this little uh, set of disks of zinc and uh, copper and, uh, and uh, wood, um, produced 2.1 volts for about four minutes or so. But this was the first so source of electricity, continuous electricity as opposed to sparks. And once a scientist had that, 
they were able to develop a number of applications. Volta himself designed the telegraph line between Milan and Pavia. And the next slide shows, in fact, that before understanding how electricity worked, there was electrolysis, electric motors, telegraph, electric generators, and so on. But it was only until 1860, when Maxwell developed his equation, that there was a real understanding of electricity. And after that, of course, there were many more developments. So theory does not always come first, usually comes later. Um, and it's not strictly necessary for application, but can, of course, turbocharge applications. So that's the hope for, from my side for why we want to develop the theory of machine learning with the hope that we understand what's going on and with the hope that we'll get even much better systems if we understand what is going on. So next slide. Um, <clears throat> this is, uh, next slide shows things that you probably all know. Next slide. Yeah, the basic, uh, the basic architecture of feed-forward networks is very simple, a series of layers of neurons and neurons are simply units that summate their inputs and then pass their inputs through a very simple nonlinearities, this uh, rectified linear unit, RLU. And so the output is a number that gets um, then passed to other neurons. And the, the, um, the things you can change, the parameters you can change in that system are the weights. So each input to a unit is weighted, and those weights are the things you are trying to set um, in order to get your network to do what you want. And one way to set them is to have a training set with inputs and correct outputs and change the inputs, the, the weights, until you get for each input the corresponding output. This is training, and this is done, next slide, using an optimization procedure that typically these days stochastic gradient descent, which is a form of gradient descent in which you um, compute the gradient of the loss um, based only on a few samples and not the whole sample set. Okay, so next slide shows, I, I want to first to speak about a possible principle, single principle that may underlie why deep learning works. It's a kind of, it's unpublished, it's a, um, a, a theorem or two, uh, hopefully correct. So I would love to have your feedback. And the other one, um, next slide, is about uh, the dynamics of learning has to do with uh, approximation, optimization, and generalization for deep learning on the square loss. This is more details. Uh, let's first start with the more general uh, principle I was, I was mentioning. So next slide. Next slide, yeah. Um, so the idea is that a principle could be what I call compositional sparsity. Next slide shows that <coughs> there are in the meantime um, a lot a number of different neural network architectures. One uh, on the left is a cartoon of convolutional networks, um, CNN, but then there are transformers, perceivers, MLP mixers, and whatever our brain is doing. And they're all kind of different. Um, there are, of course, um, neural network connection of elements we call neurons, like the brain is, um, but um, with, different, um, with different architectures. And the question is, uh, these are the ones that seem to work particularly well in a number of domains. Why do they work? Do they have in common some basic idea? So next slide shows insights from approximation theory, something that was known since the 80s is that um, both shallow networks, say one layer, hidden layer, or many layers, um, can approximate 
any continuous functions from a compact domain arbitrarily well. This was well known. This is similar to Weierstrass theorem. You can, with polynomial of sufficiently high degree, approximate arbitrarily well a continuous function from a compact domain. In this case, you don't need more layer. One layer is enough. Uh, so the question is, why, why do you have deep networks behaving much better than, than shallow networks? And, uh, and the beginning of an answer comes from the next slide that shows that, in general, it's true that you can approximate a function arbitrarily well, but you may need an enormous number of parameters. The number of parameters you need, in our case, this would be the weights that you need, is something in the order of the epsilon, which is the error you are willing to accept in the approximation, to the minus d, where d is the dimensionality. M is, you can think about the smoothness, the number of derivatives, but let's say for the moment uh, M is equal to one. So suppose uh, epsilon is 10%, so epsilon is 0 0.1, d is 10, you have 10 to the 10 um, parameters you need if you have 10 variables. So that's, uh, you know, a largest number, but the number would be huge if for instance, you consider the dimensionality of an image in CIFAR. These are small images. They are 30 by 30 or so. And this means thousands. So these thousands. So that would be the up, upper bound by this curse of dimensionality would be 10 to the thousand, which is really a big number because um, in the universe, our universe, there are two, 10 to the 80, 80 protons. So 10 to the tau is huge. So this is a real curse. The next slide shows one way to avoid the curse. This was a, a theorem we proved a, a, a few years ago with Rushikes Maskar. And this is uh, the following, that if a function that you are trying to learn, so this think of a task, um, input to output, if this task can be decomposed as a function of functions in which the functions, the constituent functions, have a small dimensionality, um, then you can avoid the curse of, a dim of dimensionality if you use a deep network with a similar graph architecture as your function. So for instance, the binary tree on, on the left can have eight variables but each node is a function of two variables. So this is a function of function of function where each constituent function has just two dimensions. And in this case, the curse of a dimensionality is not set by eight, but just by two, the maximum value of the constituent function. Okay, this is by the way, a special case of convolutional networks. And, um, but this statement is about the task, it has nothing to do with network, it's about the function you're trying to learn. So it turns out <coughs> that if a function is compositional, and I say compositionally sparse because it's compositional and its constituent function is, is depend on a small number of variables. So composition, compositional sparsity would be the general term. By the way, I did not invent it. It's uh, a statistician, Damen, who came up with it. Uh, next slide. Uh, Next, yeah. So this is a more general statement, essentially saying the same thing, but for a general uh, graph. So if you can represent a function as a directed acyclic graph, each node is a constituent function, then basically the number of parameters that you need for the whole graph uh, depends on the uh, node of the graph that has the largest number of variables. So in this case, I say four down there. Um, same thing, just generalized to arbitrary graphs. Now, in general, every function is compositionally, trivially, because you can only compose a function with it, the identity function. And the question is, um, how many are compositionally sparse functions? 
in the universe of all possible functions. Uh, next slide. Um, you know, th there is also the fact that uh, in general, a, a function has more than one compositional representation. When I speak of a compositionally sparse function, I speak of a function that has a compositionally sparse representation. Um, and next slide, uh, there are simple examples in which a function of many variables can be compositionally sparse. One is that it really depends only on a small number of variables, not all the variables that are directly involved. Other ones are more complicated, like a binary tree example. Next slide. Uh, next slide. <laughs> yeah, the, this, the, this idea of assuming that in, uh, um, you have to have the function you are trying, the target function, the function you are trying to learn to be compositionally sparse, this assumption appears more and more often in um, papers by statisticians uh, on approximation theory. It seems that if you don't do that, there is little you can do. So uh, we used to call in the original paper, we called it hierarchical, um, uh, hierarchical locality. Uh, but the better term is compositional sparsity, which is introduced by Wolfgang Damen just last year. Okay, so next slide um, says, suppose that you have functions that are compositionally sparse. Could this be a principle that uh, neural network use? Next slide. Um, shows that uh, um, the original paper about transformers. Um, and next slide shows a graph of what a transformer is. I, I cannot make much of it, of this figure in terms of understanding what is going on. I'll show you some a version of it, which is quite different. Gives, I think, a better idea of what's going on. Next slide. On the, on the left, you see <coughs> the architecture of um, essentially a deep convolutional-like network. Um, so the, the architecture is given. You're assuming that the function that you're trying to learn has the same architecture. It's made up of um, constituent functions um, and uh, and so you're using a network which has the same architecture to learn this compositionally sparse function. And because it's compositionally sparse, the number of parameters you, you need is not so astronomically high. But it, so in this case, like in a convolutional network, what you are doing is assuming that you know the graph of the underlying target function. Uh, you assume you know. Uh, your assumption is correct, and you're able to exploit this when you learn. Now, for transformers, you don't need, you don't know what the underlying graph is. You don't know that, for instance, um, the first, one of the first constituent functions depends only on those three inputs and not, no other ones. You don't know. So, what you have here is a module that is called self-attention. And this module's, um, and this part of the conjecture by me of what's going on in a transformer, this module is uh, looking at the input, getting into it, and, uh, and looking, so looking for instance at uh, this input, and then looking which other inputs are similar to it. And it does that through essentially a um, Malanobis types uh, dot product. And through the softmax operation, it selects only a few of those other inputs. So it's a system to enforce sparsity on the fly for any new input. And, and so the idea would be 
both for convolutional type networks and also for transformers, the key part is to try to infer uh, or to know and exploit or to infer and exploit the sparseness of the target function. In the first case, you know it. Second case, you just know it's sparse. You don't know what the sparsity, the structure of the sparsity. Okay, so that's a way sparsity can be exploited by networks. And the next slide, um, yeah, it gives more, a little bit more detail about this, the uh, self-attention module. But let's go to the next one. Um, uh, as I said, if uh, um, approximation is possible, and then I'll make uh, um, a, um, a case later in the analysis of deep, net, deep RLU networks that generalization is also much better if you have sparsity of constituent functions. The question, as I mentioned, are these compositional sparse function very special functions or, 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 or not? Are, are we making a very restrictive assumption when we say uh, that our target function is compositionally sparse? By the way, these are assumptions about the world and not about neural networks, are assumptions about tasks. Um, the next slide. In fact, years ago, together with a colleague of mine, a physicist, Max Tegmark, we had <coughs> put forward some assumption that may be for problems that are typical for perception uh, because of uh, laws of physics, for instance, or maybe evolution. The, uh, most of the interesting function or tasks, like recognizing an image, an image correspond to compositionally sparse function. Um, but the answer, it seems to be a bit different. Next slide. <coughs> so the, the answer seems to be, let me tell you in advance, is that practically all functions are compositionally sparse. And to uh, support this, um, let me make you a couple of definitions. This is bridging machine learning with uh, a theory of computation. So let's think of um, a definition of a sparse compositional function as a function that has a representation in terms of the composition of a non-exponential number of function, each one of which depends on a relatively small number of variables. There's a bounded number of variables. Okay, that's one definition. The other definition comes from theory of computation and Turing machines and so on, and it says that the function is computable if it's, there is a procedure or algorithm that correctly calculates a sequence of approximation to this function. And if this procedure or algorithm is uh, um, computable in polynomial time or space in the number of variables, then I call it efficiently computable. This is the same thing you do for computability in terms of a Turing machine and efficient computability when it is polynomial in uh, um, the relevant variable. So next slide shows the theorem that you can prove is that for functions that have bounded first derivatives, so not all functions, but I would argue all reasonable functions, then compositional sparsity is equivalent to efficient computability. That if this is true, this means that for most reasonable function in practice, um, you can assume that they are compositionally sparse. Okay, and, uh, and so composition sparsity will not be coming from the laws of physics or uh, evolution, but it's a property of our mathematical world. Uh, next slide that just makes a few points. Th this is a statement about, not about neural networks, it's about functions, tasks that neural networks may 
learn. Um, it says that every task can be decomposed in simpler tasks or modules. This is the same idea as a program that can be decomposed in a set of subroutines. Um, um, it's also, next slide, there are connections. It, this establishes a connection between computability and approximation theory. Um, of course, co the idea of compositionality is a very important idea in linguistics and cognitive science. Um, and uh, um, I find it quite interesting that uh, if assuming all of this it's true that uh, that um, you know this may be the principle um, on which uh, deep RLU networks are based and why they are successful. So exploiting this compositional sparsity of every task that has to be learned. Okay. Next slide. Um, uh, yeah, just outline uh, a proof that, uh, uh, for instance, um, if computable by a Turing machines, it means that um, the function that is computed can be represented by the composition of function, each corresponding, each one corresponding to the basic read-write step in a Turing machine, which is itself a sparse function. So. Um, and again, uh, next slide shows um, um, there is a pathological case about Kolmogorov theorem and Hilbert's 13 problem, but it can, I can leave that for the discussion if anybody is interested. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, makes this point that, you know, if, if there were no uh, sparse compositionality, then functions like the functions we are trying to learn um, when we recognize, we have a network recognizing CIFAR images because it's a function from R1000 to R. Um, this would imply, um, you know, it, uh, a, a curse of dimensionality is really 10 to the 80, the number of all. Um, the number, uh, the, the, the number of values you have to store in order to, to be able to reproduce that function or compute it. So that's another remark pointing to the fact that functions must be compositionally sparse, otherwise that there is be no, no way to compute them in our universe anyway. Um, okay, how much time do I have? Twenty, okay. So, next slide. Uh, it's a summary. So, uh, the Cree property of the of function of the word of tasks is this one that are compositionally sparse. That um, for such function you can approximate them without the curse of dimensionality, as I'll show in a few minutes. Generalization is much better if you have sparsity of constituent functions. Um, in, uh, um, we know that in the uh, over-parameterized square loss case, we can solve the optimization problem training by using SGD uh, with Regularization means with weight decay. And you can do that if the underlying uh, sparse graph of the regression function, the target function, is known. In, for instance, uh, convolutional networks. If you don't know the graph, then, and this is a conjecture, is that um, the optimization with the sparsity constraint is solved by transformers using self-attention and there may be better way to solve it than self-attention. That's an open problem. Okay, next slide. Um, 
I'm going now in the <coughs> for about 10-15 minutes about some of the main points in uh, there are more details so that's a separate talk on the properties of uh, RLU networks deep RLU networks um, um, trained under the square laws for classification so let's get into the next slide um, the main results we ha we have new results is that we can uh, um, reach uh, zero error um, that we um, can prove that training with SGD plus weight decay has a bias towards low rank weight matrices. I think this is new as far as I know. Um, and then uh, um, there is an intrinsic SGD noise in the weight matrices, um, th which means that you never have exact convergence. You never have even asymptotically for time going to infinity. You, ever, you always have um, non-zero gradient in the weights, at least in some of the layers. Um, we prove that there is this phenomenon of neural collapse that was discovered by David Dono and others three or four years ago. And we prove that unlike other proofs without any additional assumption, um, we prove that that can happen not only in the final layer, but also in the intermediate layers. Um, and this corresponds to a particular structure of the weight matrix, which becomes stiffer matrices with a small number of eigenfunctions that are orthogonal. And there are as many as the number of classes minus one. And then uh, the one point I want uh, to mention more in details is new generalization bound. So let me go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. <laughs> Um, yeah, very briefly, uh, this is a cartoon of the loss landscape without weight decay regularization. We know that in the case of overparameterization, you have degenerate <laughs> exact solution, zero loss solution, zero square loss solution, so exact interpolation of the labels. In our case, we consider binary classification, so the labels are plus one minus one, you have exact interpolation, and this, uh, the parameter space corresponding to this minima is highly degenerate with a dimension which is W minus N, where W is the number of parameters and N is um, the number of data points. So, and typically we train these networks with many more uh, parameters than data points. In the case of CIFAR could be um, like half a million parameters for 50,000 data points. Um, so the landscape is something with um, flat zero minima losses where the water, the blue in that the picture is, um, and we use uh, uh, pseudo polar coordinates where rho is the distance from the center. So uh, next slide shows, uh, yeah, that's the, this, uh, this would be region of zero loss and all this valley could be connected together if um, there are some theorems, if the overparameterization is large enough. Other theorems showing that gradient descent converges to those. Um, next slide, next slide. Let's, next slide, let's go quickly through a few slides. We are using, um, uh, as I said, polar coordinates instead of the W, the weights. We are using normalized weights, Frobenius norm one, and then a row of parameters with the product of the Frobenius norm of the various weights. Um, and so the network corresponding to 
normalized weight matrix is this f of x with uh, vl the top layer and then there are a lieu of all the other weight matrices and uh, the whole network not normalized is g of x equal rho time f of x um, so next slide um, um, next slide next slide um, let's go over this next slide 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 Next slide. Okay, so here typically you look at uh, 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 generalization in terms from the theoretical point, point of view. You have bounds on the expected error, uh, actually on the bound between the expected and the empirical error. Um, and to do that, you use uh, concepts like VC dimensions or Radamacher complexity. Now, um, if you use VC dimensions, the number you get, you are expecting something between 0 and 1, the expected error minus the training error. But the number you, you get are larger than the number of parameters in the network, which are a lot, like 100,000, 1 million. So the um, bounds based on uh, VC dimensions in this overparameterized case are essentially meaningless, vacuous. This is the definition of Radamacher complexity, um, uh, where the sigma i are um, random plus one variables. And um, we try to use uh, Radamacher, and uh, next slide, shows that in general uh, you get expression that gives you the generalization gap the expected error min minus the error on the training set bounded by twice the Radamacher complexity of your network plus some some term and uh, um, and what appears here is that uh, because uh, the Radamacher complexity is homogeneous you can take the row, which is um, uh, um, because of the homogeneity of the RLU, um, that becomes the product of all the rows of the single weight matrices, so it becomes a product of those. And so the overall um, complexity here, there is two row, the Radamacher complexity of the network with normalized weights. So as you can see immediately, the row, which is the product of the norms, um, controls the generalization error. Smaller row, better bound. Next slide. Um, I think it repeats the same things. Uh, you expect the square root of n from the rather macro complexity of normalized network. The next slide shows some experiments in which we see we can control rho by increasing the, lab, the random labels in the in CIFAR, and we get that increasing the random label uh, rho increases one over rho decreases, and correspond in correspond correspondence with that as we increase um, the percentage of a random label, the test error also increases. So this is exactly says uh, what we expect from the bound. Larger row, worse test error. Next slide shows something interesting. You know, most of the success stories are not dense networks, are convolutional networks. This is where the, um, apart from transformers, where the success of deep networks was. Now, 
you can find it in many papers and uh, um, everywhere in computing the Radamacher complexity of a deep network. There is at some point this um, approximation that you have the matrix W time the input or the input from the layer below X. You have you have this um, norm of WX. And typically what people do is a pretty harsh bound. It's saying, okay, um, this is, you know, less equal than, uh, you know, the norm of W times the norm of X. Okay, that's fine if uh, W is a dense matrix, but suppose that W is a, can I go back? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if W is a sparse matrix, so <coughs> for instance, if you have a convolution, the W will be a Toeplitz matrix in which you have the kernel of the convolution in one row and then the kernel of the convolution displaced on the second row and so on. Suppose you are in the lucky case in which you don't have overlap between the rows. In that particular case, instead of doing this harsh bound, the square root of the, of the norm of Wx is norm of W time norm of X, you will take into account that each kernel is now essentially multiplying, uh, doing the dot product, only with a little part of the X vector, not all of it. And if you take that into account, you will see that you have from each row of the matrix a contribution that is the norm of the kernel, the norm of the row, times a fraction of X square. And when you do all the calculation, instead of having the norm of the matrix W times the norm of X, as you have up here, you will get a bound which is the norm of the kernel times the norm of X. Okay. <laughs> this can be, you know, order of magnitudes smaller in the case of, of, uh, of uh, CIFAR, uh, because the number of rows could be thousands or so. So, next slide shows, in fact, experiments in which we measure this rho over square root of n, rho in which we took into account this estimate using the norm of the kernel, not the norm of the, the matrix, the template matrix, and we get estimates um, that are in the order, because there are some coefficients that I'm not showing, but in the order of um, um, between zero and one, or not much larger than one. So instead of getting numbers that are millions or hundred thousands, we get numbers that are very close to being non-vacuous. Um, this will be the actual experimental test error, and this will be the one estimated using this theoretical bound or rho over square root of n, without taking into account some uh, constant, which is probably in the order of two or three. And uh, uh, next slide shows a similar, similar one um, in which um, these numbers are even, even smaller. Okay, so this is just to make the point, the next slide, um, that, um, that sparsity is not only important for approximation, but it also improves generalization. It makes generalization possible or much better. Um, so these are the two points here. And, uh, and the question of whether this uh, assumption of sparseness is uh, uh, very special or not, I already answered, so I'll not answer it here. And um, I think with this, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.
Thanks, Tommaso, for the great talk. Any questions from the audience? Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, Sufian Hayu from National University of Singapore. So just, just a simple question. Um, so it seems that this uh, compositional sparsity could potentially explain generalization in deep neural networks. So a simple question would be, is there any empirical evidence that a fully trained neural network that achieves, let's say, state-of-the-art performance on some task, is there any empirical evidence that it can be decomposed as like a, compos a compositionally sparse function or something? Um, yeah, I think, um, um, you know, a, a, a neural network itself is a composition of functions. You can imagine of each layer being a function composed with the previous ones. Um, so if this was the question, the fact, um, I think uh, this is uh, in part supporting what I said. I say in part because what I said was that uh, this result of equivalence between um, compo compositional sparsity and com efficient computability holds for smooth function, for function that have bounded derivatives. And uh, um, that, that sec this last part is not something that you, you get out from just a network, right? Um, I mean, this is a more technical discussion, but we can discuss about it. But, uh, but in, uh, you know, like many of these um, um, equivalence statement, it, it sounds like a tautology. I mean, theorems are supposed to be tautologies, but some are more tautological than others. <laughs> and this one, um, essentially, you could say, you know, uh, that if you can compute it, then it's compositional, and the network is compositional, so if it works, it can be computed. That's, I think, what you said, and yeah. it's true. Um, yeah, I, I assume it should be, like, to, to prove that a neural network is computable, it should be as hard as proving that it's compositionally sparse, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, you can think of, uh, for instance, a network, a deep, lay, a deep networks as um, a series of layers, and each layer could be thought as a step or a small number of steps in a Turing machine, right? So from this point of view, you can say the equivalence of Turing machines, assuming in principle an infinite number of layers, um, it, 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 it's what, what is going on. Uh, there is the more subtle point of um, what happens if the function are not smooth, and it's not um, then completely clear to me um, the following point. In, I did not mention this, but when I speak about approximation, I speak about constructive approximation, which means that you have to be able to construct an approximation of a function from values of the function. Um, there are some approaches that show that if you if you forget about this term, you make things, then you can avoid the curse of dimensionality. But of course, these are theoretical, not practical. So if you don't have smoothness in the second derivative, in the first derivative, then it's not even clear whether you could sample values of the function in any meaningful way. You know, you can have a a continuous function support at discrete points and a completely different continuous function that has the same values of those points if you don't have any bound on the derivatives. So anyway, but that's a more technical Thank question. you. Hi, thank you for the wonderful and interesting talk. I am mainly just curious about this, the proposed theorem that you had, the, the class of 
I understand correctly, the class of computable functions is the same as the class of computationally sparse functions. Um, and, I, and I agree that com computation is, comp is compositional in nature, but I am sort of curious, it seems quite strong to me that every computable function would be computationally sparse for some reasonable k. And so I'm curious if, uh, when you say sort of computable functions, if this is sort of the classical definition or if it's something more modern like your discussions with Max Techmark, like com computable functions that come up in nature or something of this sort. Yeah, I must say, you know, um, <clears throat> for the last uh, six years, I thought that the assumption of compositional sparseness was a strong one. And uh, um, uh, uh, Max uh, Tegmark had said, well, because interactions in physics are local, you expect functions to depend only on a small number of variables and so on. I did not quite believe it. I said something like maybe evolution has wired our brain so that uh, local connectivity is preferred. So our, our brain is made up to be able to deal with sparse function and not with non-sparse ones. And so the problems we can solve and we are interested in are the sparse, the sparse ones. But, um, but if you make some restriction of what you are saying, like this uh, statement about, about smoothness, uh, bounded first derivatives, it seems that all functions must have a sparse representation. This is, you know, I think the theorem is correct, but I did not publish it, and so maybe it's wrong. If anybody of you will tell me where the mistake is, I'll be very happy to hear that and solve the problem. So I'm a little bit surprised, but not too much, because um, I found uh, over the last four years very difficult to come up with examples of functions that are not sparse. You know, everything you come up with, it seems to be the composition of, you know, relatively simple functions. And the whole computer science is built, of course, in theory of recursive functions, is built on composing stuff and getting more complicated stuff. So um, maybe the theorem is correct. I, and I know it's, um, I know you have to qualify a few things to, to define uh, things precisely, for instance, uh, it's important to say efficient computability, not just computability. You, you, you want to have a Turing machine um, with a complexity. The program it's running cannot have exponential complexity. So that's, the, the, that's not the standard definition. They, they, they're both standard, but this original one is the, the one without this restriction. Um, uh, but... Uh, 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 on the other hand, it would be wonderful if this idea of, of compositionality, of the fact that you, we, can, uh, we can decompose complex tasks in simpler ones, um, the idea of modularity and so on, that pervades, is pervasive in engineering, in science, in many things, would be kind of an intrinsic property of... Uh, of the function we are dealing with in practice. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the, for the interesting talk. So I, I, I did think that compositional sparsity is, is probably behind a lot of, you know, um, why, why we can learn interesting functions. But I wonder about the uh, uh, sort of theorem or conjecture that you've shown about, um, you know, equivalence between Lipschitz, uh, functions with Lipschitz derivatives and, 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 and uh, efficiently computable functions and the relevance of that all for um, machine learning. Because to me, it seems that, you know, uh, well, one, one thing I didn't see in this theorem is the dimension. So if you have, you know, Lipschitz derivative in high dimension, this is still as hard to learn as, uh, you know, just having a Lipschitz function, right? So just that, you know, uh, so, so sort of the way you motivated your talk, by saying that, um, you know, learning Lipschitz functions is, is impossible uh, 
that, that still holds for functions that have ellipses derivative in high dimensions. So I wonder, like, the whole talk was about learning functions, uh, but not so much about data, right? And so in some sense, functions restricted to data should be compositionally sparse. But if, let's say, you know, you say, well, you know, the support of the data is low dimensional, so I can exploit that, but you don't know the support of the data. Um, then, yeah, I'm just wondering about the role of dimension in the theorem and the relevance of that, because uh, Lipschitz's derivative is not, not 